thank you all for being here today. The, the, this is a new adventure for most of us, certainly including myself. And we've missed you all. You, we haven't seen you since February the 18th in Rockport. That was our last partner event six months ago, believe it or not. Six months have gone by. I hope that you and your family have stayed safe through this pandemic that we've been living through. And we uh, decided it was time to get back in on the saddle and uh, to create these fun times and educational sessions for you again. So this is our 172nd monthly partner event. 172nd. Our first partner event was in Jim Hogg County on a ranch owned by Bill Helen in near Hebronville. And so we're hoping that you are going to want to do this again with us. And we will be uh, sending you a survey after this is over with, probably in a day or so. And we want you to be sure and uh, fill out the, the, the survey questions to help us plan future events like this. And I uh, also want to let you know that uh, it is good to see you all and you look just like I remember and I'm glad for that. And I also just want to tell you on a personal note that I'm going to be retiring in a couple of months and so I'm particularly happy to, to be able to put these events together for the next couple of months to see you one more time. So I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and start our programs. Unless anybody wants to say anything, you might want to hold up your hand if you want to say anything or have any questions before, because we have a couple of minutes left. And if not, then we're going to move ahead with our first program which is a Corpus Christi author, Jim Maloney. He's been at a couple of two or three of our events with the books that he uh, uh, has written with Murphy Gibbons and Corpus Christi. And, but he's going to review a couple of books for us today. One of them is, and they're both by Murphy Gibbons, Thomas Noakes' Diary of War, Drought, and Hard Times, and then The Streets of Corpus Christi by Murphy Gibbons. And Jim, if you're ready, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank I'm you for being with us today. All Mike has to do is bring up the screen. Okay, we We're going to do, uh, I'm going to talk over pictures as Mike, Mike puts them on the screen. We're going to talk about our two latest books, Streets of Corpus Christi was published last fall and uh, Thomas Noakes' Diary was published earlier this year. Uh, and, and Thomas Noakes, was just an ordinary guy, but he kept a diary and it was, happened to be at a time that was fascinating. So here's a, here are the two books. Uh, the Streets is oversized. It's uh, nine, eight by 12, nine by 12. So it's a pretty good sized book with lots of, lots of photo, photographs. And Thomas Noakes is a normal, normal size uh, six by nine book with uh, mostly Thomas's uh, diaries and, and, and just a few illustrations. So let's go to the next slide. We're going to talk about streets first. And that, that is a, a view of downtown Corpus Christi before the seawall was put in. So you can see the, the uh, water street is right at the edge of the bay. And, and so the book is primarily about this area, downtown below the bluff and then up on the bluff. And then it also takes in Leopard Street, Ocean Drive, and uh, out out North Beach. So let's go to the next slide. A great picture of Corpus Christi before the seawall was built. You can actually uh, see them working on the seawall. Uh, in the lower center picture, you can see some of the dredging starting, but you can see the shoreline and how things were built directly uh, up to the shore. Uh, and that's, that's why Corpus Christi flooded in the 1919 hurricane. Unfortunately, uh, Corpus Christi didn't learn its lesson and there was another hurricane in 1933. Luckily, it did not do uh, as much damage, but eventually uh, in 1940, they began building the seawall. Let's go to the next slide. 
And here's the view of the sea of the shoreline after the seawall was built. And you can see the seawall and all that white uh, area in there is fill sand from the bay where they have dredged out on the on the outside of the seawall and pumped it in and filled it with sand. Gives you an idea of how much land was added to downtown Corpus Christi. Uh, this is before uh, Shoreline Drive was put in, before the tea heads were built, but uh, it gets, it gives you an idea of, of what was filled in on uh, downtown. So these are some of the examples of photographs that are in the book with uh, a description by Murphy. Let's go to the next page. A view down Chaparral Street in the 1940s. On the left-hand side is the uh, relatively famous Lichtenstein's department store, which was demolished a few years ago and has been replaced by uh, some brand new uh, apartments in downtown Corpus Christi. And uh, so the whole city has changed since then. But Lichtenstein's was famous in the area as a great department store and it eventually went out of, was acquired by Frost and was went out of business in the in the 80s. Next. A view of Taylor Street towards the bay. And uh, you can see this was a dirt street. Taylor Street now leads up to the bluff. It goes off shoreline. But in the far distance, you can see a uh, pavilion out in that, that is in the bay. That is the Seaside Pavilion. And, and that was a hotel uh, slash entertainment spot from until 1919, until that was washed away. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, in the foreground, you can see the, the Baptist church and the steeple is the uh, Episcopal church. So it gives you an idea of what the city looked like. This is about 1908 uh, or 1909, before any of the streets were paved. And uh, you can see it, it's a mess. There's mud whenever it rains and so forth. Next. A view of another downtown street, Laguna, looking towards the bay after the 1919 hurricane. And if you've got our 1919 hurricane book, this is the picture on the front cover. But if you're familiar with downtown Corpus Christi today, the area that is filled out in the bay is about another block and a half long. And that's where uh, Whataburger by the Bay is today. So this is the view. You got uh, the streetcar that was stranded by the storm. You've got all the debris in the streets and you got two guys in the middle that are actually looking for bodies. And then the guys on the left-hand side on the truck are loading debris so they can start clearing the streets because the first order of business after the hurricane was to clear a path through the streets. Next. Uh, a view of the bluff. You can see the bluff before it was, was uh, fixed up and uh, landscaped. Next. One of the beautiful homes on uh, the bluff that is now gone, the bluff was originally nice big homes that could enjoy the view and enjoy the breezes. And uh, Progress had them all torn down. The, the Timon home became a Maxwell P. Dunn funeral home. And eventually it met its demise when the uh, Harbor Bridge and the Crosstown Expressway were put in. So today, all the area where a lot of the big homes were is gone, and today we only have a couple left on the, on the, the south end of the bluff. Next, on North Beach, we had the uh, Skyrocket roller coaster. It was only open two years. In the second year, uh, two people died on the coaster, and so after that, they shut it down. Next. This is the, uh, the home on S curve that uh, the Donegan home that is still there today that was built in the early 20s about well about 1927 and you can see the S curve uh, on what ocean what, on ocean what is now Ocean Drive back in the early days that was a two lane road and that curve was quite steep steep and a number of people lost their lives right in front of this home next. Now we're gonna to go to the Thomas Noakes diary. This is Thomas Noakes. This is a self-portrait that he drew of himself. He was a talented man, but a poor man. He could do anything. He could draw, he could paint, he could repair things. He could build saddles, farm. He tried to ranch, but he came with very little money to the United States. 
1853 and worked for a while and then settled in Nueces town and tried to ranch on his land. Next. Uh, for those of you that don't know where Nueces town is, uh, there's a map with Corpus Christi. And if you look to the uh, about 10 o'clock and go down Upper River Road where that circle is, that is where Nueces town was. And if you bought 100 acres of land from, from uh, Henry Kinney, you got a town lot in Nueces town. So lots of, lots of people settled there. That was the only town in, in South Texas, uh, in Nueces County, besides Corpus Christi. And that's where immigrants, primarily from uh, England and Germany, but from uh, Europe, came. Kinney sold land in uh, Europe by, by, by a flyer and offered generous terms. And so Noakes took him up on that and he lived at Noasis town. Next. So Noakes kept a diary and I think he had six, he had more than six books, only six still exist. And those original books, we're gonna hear from, from uh, Carol Rettmeyer later, those six books are, are at the Corpus Christi Museum of Science and History. And uh, book, book, this is, happens to be book four and it shows what it looks like, it was written in pencil. So Murphy had, uh, copies of these, they were the copies of these at the library. So he was able to transcribe all these into the book. Next. Noakes was pretty talented. This is a painting of the Battle of Corpus Christi in 1862 against the Yankees. And you can see the Confederates firing cannons at the ships uh, led by Felix Blucher. And you can see the cavalry uh, in the distance. Uh, the Federals tried to land on North Beach and uh, the Confederates repulsed them. So they, re they won the Battle of Corpus Christi. It wasn't too much except that the city was shelled by, by cannonballs by the Federals for about two days before this battle happened. After uh, this battle, the Federals retreated and Corpus Christi was okay, so to speak. Next. Noakes also painted this painting, which is the Battle of Corpus Christi Pass. Corpus Christi Pass is now called uh, Packery Channel, and it's out on, it separates uh, Padre Island from Mustang Island. And the big boat was trying to get out of the bay. They were sounding their way out. You can see in the distance, in the, on the right-hand side, you can see a ship in the distance. That was a federal ship, and it launched these two boats, the smaller boats with uh, soldiers in it, to try to capture the uh, Confederate vessel. And the Confederates beached their boat and went ashore and climbed into the dunes. And there were seven sharpshooters from the Seguin area. And they started shooting the Yankees. And four men were, four of the Yankees were killed. They eventually retreated to the Mustang side of the pass and walked north to get rescued by the Federals again. So those two paintings were, were uh, painted by Noakes. The original of the Battle of uh, Corpus Christi is at the Corpus Christi Library, and the Corpus Christi Pass one is at uh, is owned by uh, Charles Butt, and we were able to get a picture of it. Next, so books make great presents. We got birthdays, anniversaries, and holidays coming up. Next, these are most of our books, with the exception of the last two, and uh, all of our books are forty four ninety five plus tax. And you can order them on uh, www.nuasispress.com. Let's go to the next page. That's where to get them. Uh, and you can go on, it'll take you by PayPal. If for some reason uh, you can't use PayPal, you can call me at 361-289-0100. Uh, and with that, I will, if anybody's got picture, uh, questions or something like that, I'd be happy to take your questions. And thank you for letting me talk about our books, Nancy. Thank you, Jim. Does anybody have any questions for Jim? You have to click your mic. If you've got a red mic on, you can click it. Um, how large are those paintings that we just saw, those ones by Noakes? They're both about uh, 18 by 24. And they're watercolors. Beautiful. And we're lucky to still have them. I know that uh, most of he was, a, he was a poor man, so he was trying to sell those those paintings, and I'm guessing that he did was able to sell both of them. Uh, he he paint, he painted a lot. 
uh, think about living in the 1860s and 70s with uh, no electricity. He was, he would have been working by candlelight at night. So most of the stuff was during the, done during the day. So you say he painted a lot. Uh, how many paintings do you know of? Those two. But in his diary, he talks about painting his children, painting his dog, painting a chicken and so forth. So we know he, paint, he would do some painting, but as far as I know, none of those paintings have, have uh, made it down to, to, uh, to here. 100, well, it's 150 years later. But we know from his diary that he, would, he uh, spent some time painting. It was, a, it was a different time. Normally we would not expect somebody like Thomas Noakes to have a book. Uh, he was, he did virtually nothing famous except for painting those two pictures. And then his, his store was raided by Mexican bandits in 1875. And so uh, those are the, the, the few things that uh, made, may, may, might make him known today. But since he left his, his, his story to uh, history and it's down at the museum, uh, and it's a, an, eye into what was going on during the Civil War, uh, it, it's, it, we felt it was really worth, worth painting. And it gives you a real look at what life was like in the 1850s and 1860s. From what country did he immigrate? England. He was an Englishman. I've just put a, a message up that some of you hopefully can read. Uh, to say that if you all need Jim's info, if you're interested in ordering a book, if you don't, didn't get an opportunity to save his information, you can email me and I'll be glad to send it to you. And all you gotta do is Google Nuasis Press, one word, Nuasis Press, and that has a contact if you wanna contact me or you can see all of our books. We've got 13 books on the site. There's three different pages. So when you get down to one page, you gotta to click to go to the next page and so forth. But all the books are on the website. They all have a little blurb on them about what they are, and you can see the cover of the book. We thank you very much, Jim, for being with us today, and uh, we look forward to having you another time as soon as we gotta, you. We got a book. couple more in the works, Nancy. So I'm game Great. when you when we get back to meeting again. I'll be happy to to join you. Great, thank you very much, and I I want to back up for a minute been too long since we've done this, obviously, because I forgot to even introduce myself. My name is Nancy Deveni. I'm the executive director of the Texas Tropical Trail 20 County region. I live in Live Oak County on the shore of Lake Corpus Christi. And so I know most of you know me, but I just wanted to throw that in there. And I also want to let you know that now we're getting ready to have a virtual tour of the Port Aransas Museum. And we're going to have Cliff Strain, who's the director of the museum. He's going to tell us about the museum's exhibit going on right now. It's called the Tarpon Era. It was the 1880s to the 1950s. And when Port Aransas, the, the city's activities centered around tarpon fishing. So Cliff, I'm gonna turn it over to you and Mike please. Dr. Barron's uh who led the team on building the exhibit, and he's going to do the introduction. Port Aransas is actually a bad name for the town because it was a port for only seven years, whereas it was a fishing village for something like 140 years. And um, um, yeah, for about seven decades, the fishing was for tarpa. People came from all over the world to, uh, to catch tarpa here from the uh, farmers taking their uh, winter breaks in their pickup trucks to uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the president, coming to town to fish for tarpon. One of the visitors that no people don't know too much about is A. Simple McPherson. Have you heard the story of A. Simple McPherson? 
Amy, a person, that remarkable person. She weighed 180 and her hair was red and she preached a wicked sermon so the newspaper said. One day, they had a camp meeting down in my ocean park. She preached from early morning until after dark. She said a benediction and folded up the tent and no one knows where Amy went. And that became the mystery. Where did Amy went? Hello, I'm Cliff Strain, the director of the Fort Aransas Historical Museum, and uh, welcome to our exhibit. And of course, as Dr. Barron said, this uh, exhibit kind of chronicles the events and activities of the town when the main event was catching tarpon during a period where the tarpon were quite numerous. So late 1870s to 19, mid 1950s, uh, where we saw a dramatic decline in our population. But up to that point, uh, at the beginning of this era, they were catching 1,400 to 2,000 very large tarpon per year. And of course, the fish was not edible, but it had a reputation of being a fierce fighter. The Silver King would come shooting out of the water, jumping sometimes several body lengths and shaking his gills, flaring them out and uh, trying to shake the hook of the fishermen. So a lot of fishermen considered the tarpon to be on their list of fish that they must catch. When they came to town, originally they could stay at the Tarpon Inn. The Tarpon Inn started off as a World War II barracks, turned into a fishing camp and then eventually a fishing hotel and it was very very popular and uh, it still stands to this day it's been burnt it's been uh, blown apart in pieces by hurricanes but always rebuilt on the same uh, footprint and uh, if you stayed with the tarpon it always has been a tradition that you would get one of these awards if you caught a tarpon while staying there and they would put your scale up on the wall and to this day you can still go into the tarpon in lobby and see those tarpon with the names and the dates of the people that caught them. And they're very large scale, so it's very easy to read. If you didn't stay at the tarpon for a short period of time, you could have stayed at the tarpon club. This is a very little known secret of a place that existed on the south end of St. Joe's Island. It was put together by E.H. Green. It was designed as a club for world-class fishermen to come and enjoy you know, a wonderful place to stay with brass fixtures in the bathrooms. They had hot and cold running water, a, their own power plant, an electric elevator, and a launch, an elect, a motorized launch that would pick you up and take you to the club. However, at the beginning of the tarpon era, you were going to go out with a rowboat. So if they, when somebody needed a guide to take them out, they would put a flag up in the Tarpon Club and then people here in Tarpon, Texas, the name of our town before Port Aransas, would see their flag and row across the channel to pick up their customer and take them out to the end of the pass to fish for Tarpon. And then later again, rowing them back to the Tarpon Club and rowing back to Tarpon. So the early Tarpon guys were pretty sturdy lot as far as being able to do all that rowing. Of course, toward the, the, uh, toward the end of that period, uh, we started as the Tarpon Club was, was uh, kind of disassembled in 1905, uh, but the, their, they continued to have the tournaments until about 1909. The boatmen started coming on. They came on much later. And for those of you that have never seen a tarpon, this is a natural skin mount of the winning fish of the tarpon rodeo. So the, this was, if you look at this, we'll come back to the tarpon rodeo trophy we have on display, but on the trophy it says, North Milliken caught this in 1932. This is a natural skin mount by the Brundrett family, one of the original founding families of the town, uh, lived on first in the Aransas settlement, and when St. Joe's, that was on St. Joe's, and when St. Joe's was bought, they moved to Port Aransas, and became the first tax of Ernest. But Tot North Milliken was not the person that caught this fish. It was caught by Totsy Milliken, his wife. But it must have been a prejudice against the wife or other females beating 
the men at fishing, which is still continues to this day, is to be a pretty much a natural phenomenon of women over fishing the men on a fishing trip. So they gave the trophy to her husband, North Milken, and that's what is on the trophy today. And here is the trophy with North Milliken's name right here. So a little bit of injustice in that first tarpon rodeo. That was the first tarpon rodeo which became the deep sea roundup. And of course, another big deal that happened in Port Aransas, as and Dr. Barron's mentioned it, was the president coming to fish for tarpon in Tarpon, Texas. And uh, he knew that he was going to have to fish with local guides. And most of the local guides by the 1930s were fishing from Farley boats. Now, Farley boats were, came just the perfect time. Fred Farley was already here in town in 1914. He saw the opportunity for motorized boats. As you can see, when Ed Cotter started towing out the rowboats, I think that all the guys thought, well, I do not have to work as hard at fishing if I had a motor. So Fred called his brothers, and in 1915 they came, and they started building boats in Port Aransas specifically designed to catch tarpon. And they were very good. They trolled at a very slow speed. They were extremely sturdy boats, very stable for fishing at the end of the pass, where it was often very rough. And also they were very low to the water, so you could pull that heavy fish onto the boat once you've caught it. And the president recognized this. He understood the seaworthiness of the boat. He knew that if he was going to keep, have a good chance of catching tarpon, he needed to fish with local guides on this locally built boat specifically for tarpon. And in 1937, he did exactly that fishing with Don Farley in this picture, and you can see two Secret Service men in the front, Elliot, his son, helping hold up the fish with, with Fred Farley and Don Farley at the helm. Uh, the next day, he fished with Ted Matthews on the sister boat, it's an Amani boat. And when I say sister boat, I mean it more in ways than one because Manny Matthews, who uh, just recently passed away uh, last week, his dad owned two boats, and, and he named them after his kids. Manny boat was this one, and the one he caught the fish on with the president was the Marcy boat, as you can see in this picture. And also, you can see this is supposed to be the uh, rod locker that the president used to carry his rods and reels when he came down, because he came down initially on a destroyer, one of two destroyers, and the presidential yacht, the Potomac, which he came, which he stayed on in the channel behind the St. Joe's Island. So, and for more information about that trip, you're just going to have to come and visit. Uh, the end of the Tarpon era, after you know World War II uh, and into the 1950s, you now there's a lot of discussion in why the tarpon disappeared. And uh, the popular theories are that it was overfished. And the truth is, it might be a combination of all these uh, theories. Another one is the, da the uh, dynamiting and netting of tarpon for food for pets in Mexico may have further uh, declined the population. And uh, a, a lot of scientists believe the increase in salinity, saltiness of the bay, is due to the damming of the Noasis River and other small rivers and creeks in that fed into the bay system increased the salinity and tarpon larva, which is uh, explored in a, a separate area where we have some scientific posters about tarpon. Tarpon larva appear to be uh, very sensitive to high salinities, and that might be the reason why that population never came back. So uh, if you'd like to find out more about our the tarpon era, please come by. We have some incredible uh, different types of antiques on sale. We have, I mean, on display, we have a, a coffee and creamer set from the Tarpon Club, which is you know one of the few remnants left after it was sold for parts to a to a Corpus Christi hotel. 
And also, if you want to uh, hear more of the Amy McPherson ballad, you can also get Dr. Barron's to play more for you. And he's going to, we're going to finish off with a couple more verses to tantalize your interest in the ballad. Parents? Well, that's the question we left, left off was, where did Amy went? And uh, nobody really knew until we started putting this Tarpon era together, and I started going through the archive pictures that we have of Tarpon and the people that caught them, and I found this one of Amy the person standing next to a Tarpon, said that she caught the Port Aransas. So that's solved the mystery, but the Californians didn't know that. So out in California, a grand jury started an investigation, turned up a lot of spicy information, found out about a love nest down in Colorado by the sea, where the liquor was expensive, but the loving was free. They found a little cottage with a breakfast nook, a worn out bed, pulled down bed with a worn out look. The slats were all busted and the springs were all loose, and the dents in the mattress fitted Amy's caboose. So they caught, caught poor Amy and they put her in jail. Last I heard, she was out on bail. I sent her up for a stretch, I guess. She slowed herself into an awful mess. There's a couple more verses, but again, you'll have to come to Puerto Ranches in the museum to hear them and put a few dollars in the contribution box. So we hope to see you there. We're open Thursday through Friday, one to five. And uh, we can also do groups uh, on, you know, by appointment at other times, uh, all you have to do is call the museum or visit our website, portarancismuseum.org. Thank you very much for visiting the Port Aransas Museum and the Tarpon era. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. And we appreciate your participation today and your tour, and we look forward to visiting you in person soon. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure participating. Now it's time to um, introduce our board members. And maybe if some of y'all haven't figured out, um, if you, uh, you have a choice of gallery view or speaker's view, if you want to um, change the video to um, a big video. Um, Nancy, thanks so much for putting all this together. And uh, welcome everybody to this brand new adventure uh, during this partner event. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the board members. My name is Valerie Bates. I'm the board chair and the marketing director for the city of Port Isabel. And um, really excited to have everybody here and excited to see this programming. I hope it inspires you all to stay in contact with our museums, which really need the support right now and always. Um, Bart, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Did you hear me? Yes, you wanna introduce okay. yourself please and, <clears throat> and what's going on with the Refurio Museum. Bart Wales with, uh, I live in Refurio. I am the director of the Refurio County Museum. Uh, we are getting ready to have our museum demildewed and mold removal. And we, anyway, it's been a nightmare. Thanks, Bart, and thanks for hanging in there. Uh, Wanda Greenhill, unmute yourself. Uh, Mark Carlisle? Yes, uh, Mark Carlisle, and I'm from the uh, I'm, uh, Corpus Christi. I'm with the Nueces County Historical Commission and uh, South Texas Historical Association. Uh, as she mentioned about the museums, uh, if everybody will, uh, at the tail end, we're going to have a little trailer just to kind of introduce the museums in our area. Guess one of the projects that we've been working on over the past six months is to gather an inventory of our museums. Um, and do what we can to add a voice to theirs to uh, remind folks of the treasure of museums that we have in our region. We were actually very surprised to learn there were a few museums out there that we were not aware of. So in our 20 county regions, we have 81 museums and very proud of that. Uh, but do remember that they need your help. Uh,
contact them, uh, buy their books, um, support them on social media, it all counts. Wanda, are you there yet? I think I am, can you hear me? Okay, Wanda. <laughs> okay, my name is Wanda Greenhill. I serve on the Rio Grande Valley Museum Association of Harlingen, which supports Harlingen Arts and Heritage Museum. We have continued to work on our historical museum uh, through this pandemic. Um, we're coming along nicely and hopefully in one of these sessions, you're gonna see some pictures of how we're coming along. And glad to be here and I think this has just been grand. Yes, we're gonna have a sneak peek of uh, uh, behind the scenes of the Harlington Museum Project. It's um, absolutely beautiful and inspiring. Uh, Penny Pelak. Yes, good morning. I'm Penny Pelak. I live in Oladulce, which is between Alice and Robstown. I also spend a lot of time in Port Aransas because I work part-time at the high school. <coughs> I'm a member of the New Aces County Historical Commission, and I do the bulletin for the New Aces County Historical Society. And it's so great to see everybody out today because we have really missed y'all. And thank you, Nancy, for putting this together. And Mike, thank you for all your technical support. Thank you, Penny. Uh, Lori. Lori Hi. Bellows. I'm Lori Bellows. I'm from Referio, Texas. And I'm chairman of the Referio uh, County Historical Commission and um, on the board of the uh, Ferro County Museum. And this has been great and I've enjoyed seeing everyone. It's great to see you, Laurie. Edward Meza. Good morning, everyone. My name's Edward Meza. I live in Port Isabel, and I'm fairly new city manager for the beautiful town of Laguna Vista. And uh, I'm on the board of the Cameron County Historical Commission, and I thank everyone for being here. It's just a wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Um, and we're, we're missing uh, Marlette Bond today, who is also a board member because she's busy at the King Ranch getting tours. We're happy to announce that they have reopened. And, um, uh, you know, it's a, a sign of life. Um, I also would like to introduce um, Teresa Caldwell. Uh, she is the uh, program coordinator for the Texas Heritage Trails program. Teresa. Yes, I am here. <laughs> I am the state coordinator of the Texas Heritage Trails program, and we're really happy to see everybody and um, thankful that you could pivot um, in this pandemic time because, you know, we all need to get information in a different way now, and we want to continue with your wonderful events. And so we just, we're just very happy that you're able to do this, and we think it's a great benefit to everybody and something that'll outlast the pandemic. So something you can incorporate into, you know, maybe your upcoming events as well, even when we can get together in person. So very happy to be here and to see everybody. Uh, it's been great, of course. We've been staying in touch throughout, um, you know, over the last past six months as we've evolved to this stage. Um, and it's been a true partnership here in our region and with this state agency. Um, very, very important. Um, Teresa, did you want to say anything about the TACDB award that was given out for the, um, at the, for the state fair exhibit? Um, sure. I can do that. Let me see where my information is. So we're very happy to congratulate the executive directors. They received second place in the cooperative marketing category at the Texas Association of Convention, Convention and Visitor Bureau Idea Fair, and that was for their destination days. And that's something the EDs put together at, for State Fair to highlight um, a particular destination each day. So we know how much time and effort you know you put into preparing for and then participating in State Fair. So we always have a booth in the Go Texan Pavilion. Um, but it's really nice to see that your good work was acknowledged. And so you know, cheers to a job well done to all of them. Um, so unfortunately, as many of you probably already know, there will not be an in-person State Fair this year um, for obvious reasons. Um, but Go Texan Texas Department of Agriculture wanted to be able to highlight. Um, all of the participants that would normally be in the pavilion. So they're putting together a website to do that. So it'll be like a virtual Go Texan Pavilion. And so one of the good things about that is that they asked for a video highlighting what you would be highlighting at the booth. 
And so when I got with our communications people, we didn't really have a good video that highlighted the entire state heritage tourism for the entire state. Um, so um, very quickly put together a pretty good video um, that we will be, and I think the board has seen it. We're gonna wait to roll it out until it's up on the um, Go Texan Pavilion website. Um, but we think that was uh, something really good to come out of it because we can use that video in a number of ways. So we're very happy with that. And so starting September 25th, when the, the regular state fair would, be, would have been opening, that's when the website will be available and they'll be promoting it in a number of ways. And that's when you know everybody can see all of the, everything that should have been in the pavilion. So they're trying to do what they can since we can't be in person as well to promote products and make sure people understand you know, all the good things that are still going on. So those are a couple of good things. Some of us have uh, been able to get a sneak peek of that video. Well done to communications. Uh, so we're excited to roll that out over our digital channels when we get a chance to. Yes. Thanks so much for joining us today, Teresa from uh, Austin or the Environs. Round Very Rock. <laughs> in my <laughs> kitchen in Round Rock. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce uh, Rick Stryker, our ex officio board member in Austin. Rick? Ooh. Hello, Rick. Okay, did I unmute? I thought once Mike, Mike muted me, he could unmute me, but I guess not. At any rate, uh, until earlier this year, I was uh, the representative for Texas Tropical Trail on the Texas Heritage Trails LLC. And uh, Mike Carlisle succeeded me there, uh, so I'm no longer doing that. Uh, but uh, one of the things that the that the LLC is doing is publishing, of course, the Authentic, Authentic Texas magazine. And the solution, the, the uh, workaround, is to have that become as much online and a script subscription available as possible. So AuthenticTexas.com um, is. Uh, at least until we are able to distribute magazines again fully, is the primary source for accessing the Authentic Texas magazine. Thanks so much, Rick, for hanging in there with us. Um, and I'd like to introduce Commissioner Monica Burdett, joining us from um, some undisclosed location, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Even a secret, you know. Actually, I'm seeing so many of my um, neighbors on the screen here today. I, I see a lot of Rockport people here, and I'm so happy about that. Um, I just want to congratulate you, the Texas Tropical Trail Board, and Nancy, and all of your hard work and inventiveness in getting this launched. You know, as somebody just said, it's, and we're doing everything different nowadays, and we're all learning as we go along. And I just think that you all's creativeness is just amazing. Um, for those of you who may not know, there are 10 different heritage trail regions in Texas. And we happen to be part of the Texas Tropical Trail region. And by far, in my humble opinion, you all are the trendsetters for the other nine trails because you all just never give up and I applaud you for that and thank you for making it, you know, keeping us in mind as to what we want to see and you all just never fail. So thank you very much for doing this today. Commissioner Burdett, we really thank you for all your support uh, that you've been for us to the rest of the commission um, and your enthusiastic participation in our programs. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're my pleasure. Um, Nancy, you want to introduce the next speaker and get us back on track? Sorry, I got us off time and um, your, your, your reach uh, did not get me. <laughs> I think that, uh, well, I know we're running a little over time and so we're going to extend everything for about five minutes so we can get back on track. Because we have a, our, our next presentation is from Carol Rettmeyer, the president and CEO of the Corpus Christi Museum of Science and History. And they're going to do a, some little vignettes. We're going to watch those in a few minutes. And they are performed by professional actors. And it's going to be a little teaser because our September 15th event, which you want to mark your calendars, is going to feature the Corpus Christi Museum of Science and History with some other programs that we'll soon be telling you about. 
But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Carol and uh, go ahead and do as you have planned, and we'll just uh, go with the flow. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. So really a pleasure to be here, and thanks to everyone. And um, also, I just want to say hi to Rick Stryker. Rick has been a long time uh, director, I think over 30 years here at the museum uh, prior to me, and just want to say a, a shout out to him, and good to see you. Um, yeah, we're excited at the museum. We've actually been open since June. We had an incredible summer camp that I can't believe we actually made through 11 weeks during COVID, but they were successful. Um, and we are now doing a museum academy, and that's to help kids who are, are required to stay at home uh, because of COVID and school closures and home learning. So we're helping those with uh, parents who have to work. So we have an incredible program going on. Um, other than that, it's a little quieter than normal, uh, but we still do have traffic here at the museum and it's very safe and a lot of protocol. So we welcome you to come out if you're feeling comfortable to, to get out. And um, this is a great forum and we're excited about it. We have something here at the museum called Museum Live and it's our way of making history come to life and we make it come to life uh, through uh, actors and we have actors, our, our full-time employees here at the museum. And of course my phone would ring while I'm talking when it, we just, here we go. Uh, Full-time um, actors here at the museum and they make history come to life. And it's really helpful, particularly for the younger family members who come to the museum and aren't able to read. We're adding a lot of new exhibits too, and I'll tell you about that later. But we have little snippets, so these are little shorts. Um, normally each one of the sections are a little bit longer and, and a little bit more information, but I think you'll enjoy it. And coming up September, we are going to give you um, a kind of behind the scenes, uh, a tea with uh, Petra Ken Kennedy is what we're looking at doing, and you'll see more about that. So it'll actually be very informational, but in a, uh, historical sort of uh, tea talk. So I think you'll join. Anyway, uh, I believe you have the video on your end and I hope you just enjoy it. This is just a little bit of playfulness and fun to see three vignettes taking place at the late uh, 1800s. So kind of following along with the other two stories. Well, howdy folks. Welcome to the Jones General Store. My name is Josiah Jones, proprietor of this here shop, and our motto here is everything for the family. Everything for the young, everything for the old, and of course, everything for those of us in between. All right, so to my understanding, we do have some homemakers here in our store. In the Jones General Store, we have a fine selection of meats and cheeses alike. This cheese is actually only about six months old, so uh, I would hop on that train before it leaves the station, of course. Our homemakers will be, uh, very interested and very aware of what we have here, right? And of course, you know, we have a good old-fashioned butter churn. And all you do is you open this, you stick all your fixings in there, your necessities, you close this butter churn, and you turn away. And of course, you can be churning all day, churning all night, but eventually, that churn is going to be hard on your back, and you're going to be yelling at yourself, there's got to be a butter way to do this. And there is. So, if you're willing to pay just a little extra, you can leave the Jones General Store today with a brand new cedar cylinder butter churn for churning on the go. You can churn while you're waiting in line at the bank. You can churn while you're walking yourself to school. Or you can churn while you're taking a nap. That's my favorite way to churn butter. So one of the important things I always love to discuss with visitors is the difference between shopping with a small town store owner like myself versus shopping with Mr. Sears and Roebuck and their fancy mail order catalogs. Yes, they're quick, kind of quick, but there are things that I can offer you as a small town store owner that they cannot. One is the environment that you can get whenever you come into my store. Come in, I welcome you with a greeting, ask you how you're doing. Uh, maybe your carriage is a little weak, one of the wheels, so I'll talk to you, we'll get a hold of the blacksmith and we'll get that fixed up for you. Maybe your cousin, I heard he had the gout, so maybe I can help you with a couple of oranges, some nice fruit to give your cousin. Oh, I got you. If you are down on luck or down on times, we are willing to trade and barter for goods and services. So you come on in, you tell me, Mr. Jones, I need some help with this or with that. I'll be more than willing to help you. I bought or something. Maybe you can do a service for me in exchange for one of my goods. 
And before you leave here today, I do have to mention the sale that we're having on these nails right here. Very special, very durable nails. So durable, I have a guarantee on them. You go ahead and take these nails home, build a house out of them, your house will stand for 500 years. And if it doesn't, come back in 500 years and I give you your money back. You can't get any better than that. Mr. Jones. Oh, Callaway. How you doing, sir? Town banker. How can I help you? Just fine. How are you? I'm doing well. All right. I need you to get the new washing machine. I'm selling a house down the ways. So I'm looking to uh, make it look more homely. Oh, perfect. We'll get right this way. We'll look at this model. Very nice model, too. Very sturdy. Oh, come on in. I'm sure you're uh, Miss Lucy, the new schoolhouse teacher. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Calloway, town's banker. I was hoping to purchase a house. Oh, excellent. This here yes. is the house for you. Let me show you what we're all about here. Comes fully furnished. You get this nice brand new rug beater for beating dirt and whatnot out of your rugs, making it brand new again. I tell you, you can't beat this deal. The floors here are nice cedar wood planks, nailed in nice and tight using square nails from the general store on down the road. Now the walls here, I mean, I don't know if it's called shell creed. It's a brand new material, which is composed of uh, sand, sill, lime, and baked oyster shells. You can't eat them though, sorry about that. It comes with this nice new water pump installed in home. This can get your fresh clean water indoors. So what are you waiting for? Make this house your home. Installed in the home, this brand new pot belly stove for keeping you nice and warm in those cold, cold nights. I see you have a washer over here. Yes, we do. This is a newer model. You see, you just take open the lid, all your clothes and whatnot in there, your water, water soap or two, close up real good. And instead of your, uh, your old classic hand, we've got this here new foot pump too, so you just give it a few little pumps like so. Oh, it even has its own ringer. Yes, ma'am. Don't you need that something? A little time saver right there. So, Miss Lucy, what do you say? Will this house be yours? Okay, Mr. Calloway, thank you so much. It is getting a little dark outside and I have to head back to the schoolhouse. Oh, uh, yes, it is getting mighty late. Again, I'm the best banker here in town. You can find a better deal anywhere else. So, uh, just make a decision and we'll meet up again soon. All right now? All right. I man. appreciate your help. Thanks for stopping on by. I appreciate it. Thank you, Miss Lucy. Have a good night. are looking for a new location for education. Now, it is a little bit after four o'clock, so class is done, but you do look like you've been riding the shanks, Mayor, so come on in and we'll make your trip worth it. School starts sharply at 8 a.m. every morning. I'll go ahead and ring my bell. That will prompt everybody to go ahead and line up right outside my door. Once I see everybody's nice and lined up, we'll go ahead and come on right in. We do have our youngest at the front. Oldest at the back. Our pot belly stove is nice and ready and hot with our water. We bring it right over here and wash our hands, clean ourselves up. Now, some of us do get a little bit dirty. We had quite a walk in the morning, so that's understandable. We'll go ahead and hang up our coats right over here. We grab our eclectic first reader and we go on ahead and take our seats for the day. Now, I gotta say, I'm very thankful for my community. Because of them, I have this blackboard here that's made of slate. We also have small slates for all of our children. I know you might be a little bit worried about the yellow fever, but don't worry, we do have a brand new hospital in town, and I'm sure Dr. Spawn will be ready to take care of you any day. So if you have any questions, let him know about that, okay? It is getting a little late, and I do have to go, so thanks for stopping by. Have a great day. I'm Dr. Arthur E. Spahn. Come in. Well, that is it. We hope you enjoyed the little snippets. Um, and if you do come by the museum, there's a much longer show for each of those. And we'll have more for you coming up at our next on September 15th. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Carol. We appreciate it. And I know that everyone is going to look forward to September 15th and having an opportunity to visit more of the Corpus Christi Museum of Science and History.
Well, did y'all enjoy this little uh, uh, virtual event today? We hope you did. I can tell by most people's faces that it appears you're having a good time and enjoying it. And uh, we actually have some folks here with us today who we are looking forward to creating future events with at, at their museum. So uh, even though I'm not gonna be putting these together for you, I know that they will still be wonderful in the future. And I hope I have an opportunity to join y'all as an attendee at that time. And we're gonna, as I said a while ago, we're gonna be sending y'all a survey uh, in a few days. And it'll be something like our clipboard surveys we had for our in-person events. It'll help us plan future events. So please uh, don't hesitate to contact us. Let us know what you think about this event and your critique of the event and what you'd like to see. I see that it's just a few minutes before uh, 11 o'clock. We're gonna go right into our business meeting, our monthly business meeting uh, in about, about 11.10. And so we have a couple of minutes. If anybody would like to uh, say Nancy, anything, Mike. Nancy, Nancy, I wanna add something. Okay. I, I wanna say um, thanks to the board and uh, for hanging in there with us over the past months if we, as we found our way um, to this day, which now seems so obvious, but took six months to uh, evolve into. And um, uh, we, as we're going into the future and looking forward to in-person events, we wanna continue this as a component uh, alongside our personal events. We realize um, historically, not everybody can make it to every meeting and we don't want y'all to miss anything. So we wanna make that opportunity available. Um, our a big, big thanks to uh, the Corpus Christi Museum and the uh, Port Aransas Museum for participating today. And Jim Maloney, um, buy, buy, buy books. And we need to support our local museums and our, um, uh, which often sell books also, and our local authors. Um, big thanks to Nancy for um, dusting off the partner event uh, template and uh, shoehorning it into this virtual event, well done. And thanks to everybody who joined us today. If this is your first time experiencing a partner event, imagine what it's gonna be like um, in person because we have food. So um, uh, thanks so much for, for joining us today and looking forward to September. I'd like to say that I wanna give, it couldn't have been done without Mike Carlisle and Valerie as well. and. It gave me lots of nightmares, but it went off perfectly, and I thank you very much. <laughs>